so good afternoon all uh, we are just waiting for ms fatime uh, ashrafi to join us uh, she is one of the presenters uh, and then we'll begin uh, with the webinar yeah so she is in Okay, so uh, we have all the presenters of the webinar today with us. Uh, we'll begin by 105, 1305 uh, IST. Uh, just give, let's give two minutes to the participants who are joining us. Uh, so I'll request you to please uh, hold on for two minutes and then we'll begin. Yeah, so uh, we'll begin. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Salam alaikum, Akal, and Namaskar to all of you. Today's webinar on localized search capacity in humanitarian action is being organized by Leadership in Emergency Action, Preparedness, Search, that is LEAPS hub of EDRR and that is Asian Disaster Reduction and Response Network. Uh, today's Webinar, the synthesis from today's webinars and presentations and discussions will feed into policy recommendation paper along with the ADRRN's post-2020 strategy. Today's webinar is hosted by Radar India. We are based out of Pune, India, and our event co-hosts are ADRRN, IC, UNOCHA, UN OCHA, and Community World Survey. So uh, about this webinar, as you all are aware of the fact that past one year uh, since the onset of COVID-19 pandemic uh, engulfed almost the whole world, uh, the critical and timely complementary role played by local and grassroots organizations to the government's response uh, against COVID-19 uh, across the globe was brought forth very clearly. Uh, the scenario which developed over the past year where mobility and access to vulnerable populations was restricted uh, as a result of subsequent lockdowns, uh, which we saw uh, across the world, uh, whether it was in India, Bangladesh, uh, or in uh, Europe, 
or in america or uh, sorry america did not uh, in some states it was there so uh, during these lockdowns uh, what we all saw was uh, you know the look the response which was taken uh, by local csos uh, grassroots organizations whether it was personal mobilizing uh, appropriating risk and responding to covid-19 uh, induced humanitarian crisis uh so the role which uh, you know the personnel from these local grassroots organizations played uh, in awareness generation distribution of relief items uh they were at the forefront all this while uh these so these uh, these actions and uh, the lessons which we have learned uh, from uh, covid-19 response uh, uh they somewhere point towards you know the, the need for strengthening uh, the critical role of local action so for today we're going to have we have uh, five eminent uh, speakers uh, i'll introduce briefly about them uh, dr mohammed fawadul islam from dhaka community hospital trust bangladesh uh he will be presenting case study on responding to cyclone amphan amid amid uh, covid-19 and capacity needs uh, required on the field uh we have second speaker uh, ms fatima ashrafi from hami uh, iran she is also the founder member of the organization uh she will present on covid-19 response with refugee and migrant population in iran and afghanistan we have with us ms uh ms karen cheva uh she she is from maha ekonet and she will be uh, it's a very interesting uh, this covid response uh, multi stakeholder covid 19 response uh, which took place in mumbai and she uh, speaking uh, to us on learning from this multi stakeholder covid 19 response in mumbai uh, we have with us uh, mr rahul day from radar india he will be speaking on online capacity building of frontline workers and elected uh, representatives for covid-19 response uh, which radar india conducted in states of maharashtra and gujarat we have with us uh, ms maria holsberg from uh, un women uh, gender and humanitarian action so she will be speaking to us the about the what do we need to ensure that you know women focus organizations are part of covid-19 humanitarian research so uh, you can see these are we have speakers from different regions and we have a spectrum of uh, stories which took place uh, as covid-19 response we will be hearing these speakers uh, over the period of uh, you know the next 2 hours uh, and uh, now i would like to invite dr mohammed fawadul islam from dhaka community hospital trust to uh, start uh, with his presentation thank you thank you akilesh and good afternoon to everyone so i start with go through a presentation the small presentations So I am Dr. Fuad, Muhammad Fuadul Islam. I am from the Dhaka Community Hospital Trust. It is a trust-owned, private, non-profit, and self-financed organization, and it is established in 1988. And Dhaka Community Hospital Trust has some academic institute. We have the Dhaka Community Medical College. We have the Nursing College, and Medical College Hospital is a 500-bedded research hospital, and we have some research institute, uh, mostly focused on health issue on arsenic and lead. Besides this health and academic institute, we have a rich disaster risk management center, and we are providing disaster management, safe water supply, and community-based development program. Dhaka Community Hospital Trust is a large experience to work disaster risk reduction and management, both nationally and internationally. Next slide. So, COVID-19 pandemic is. now the worldwide but the besides this covid 19 pandemic bangladesh during the last one year bangladesh we have facing uh, lots of other disaster climate change disaster and now we are try to correlate between the 
cyclone Amphan that uh, occurred in Bangladesh in this year uh, to this uh, along with the COVID-19. Next slide. So COVID-19 hits worldwide and actually we know that still today there is 67.3 uh, million cases are detected and 1.54 million deaths occur. And not only that live, people live, the global economic growth rate reduced to 8% in 2020. And world economic struggling with rising unemployment, it is a big issue for the world economy. The economic and social disruption caused by this pandemic is devastating. Millions of people are at risk of falling into extreme poverty which the number of un undernourished people currently estimated about 690 million, but at the end of this year, it may be around 132 million. So this not, not only affect the global leader, Bangladesh is a small country in the world, but with a large population, it's a big population, around two crore people are living in this small area, 20 crore people are living in this small area. And till today we have 4.8 million cases detected. It is the detected case, but the actual scenario is actually at most much more higher. And we have around six, 7,000 dead till today. So economy of Bangladesh, which is emerging and developing to a mid economic countries has already experienced weaker growth. The shock of COVID-19 now makes the challenges, the economic face more burden. The, huge life loss, unemployment, low production, reduced remittance and export from the ready-made garments since the outbreak of COVID-19, which will make the very struggle for the national economy. Actually, you know that the, uh, the developing countries like Bangladesh, we are mostly dependent on the remittance of our uh, foreign remittance and also it depends on the export from the garment sector. The, the unemployment from the whole world creates a lots of unemployment in Bangladesh also, and lots of Bangladeshi workers who are returned back to the their return back to country in this pandemic, and the export from the ready-made garments has reduced a lot. So lots of garments workers also lost their job and unemployment during this pandemic period. With large population poverty, illiteracy, and corruption in this country issue makes the situation more harder. Dhaka Community Hospital Trust establishes a stronger health and social system that maintain its staff safety first and then prevent and mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in the community of Bangladesh, urban to rural region, who actually our goal to develop a resilience community by awareness program. program. Next slide. At the same time, the families struggling to cope the COVID-19 remains exposed to a climate-related disaster. In May 2020, Bangladesh was struck by Amphan, the most powerful cyclone in in last 20 years. And it is caused the coastal region, 26 districts in our country, mostly the Shatkira, Khulna, Bagherhar, Jalkati, Pirojpur, this kind of most 20, more 26 districts of our country is affected in this cyclone Amphan, and it uh, claimed about 100 lives and destroyed the homes and livelihoods of thousands of families in the coastal region of Bangladesh. 2.4 million people were, have been forced to evacuate from their homes during this Amphan region, and the economic burden is almost 3.25 billion at that time. Next slide. The coastal community who are most vulnerable to the COVID-19 pandemic are the same people who are living, who are living on the front lines of the climate change. A lot of people push further into poverty because of coronavirus. The communities are battered by intense storm, floods, cyclone that destroy their damaged homes, agricultural land, school roads, and it makes the things more worse. The Dhaka Community Hospital during this period has done an emergency relief operation with its own fund and also from gathering funds from the other organization to the vulnerable community by distributing food pack and providing the uh, home, 
tarpaulin for their damaged roof, oral rehydration saline from the waterborne diseases, and for development and for their for uh, their livelihood, they're distributing agriculture seeds, fish net for living wood support. In addition, it also distributes uh, face mask awareness message, including leaflet, postal placement in the villages and the community, announcement in the local local language on safety measure, teaching high hand washing techniques, safe distancing, usefulness, wearing mask, home and institutional quarantine method, education of cyclone affected people. So the education level of our country that is very low and the people are living beyond poverty. So to keep the people to avoid these whole things and to keep the people in their home room for the quarantine period is a very tough situation in this country. But Dhaka Community Hospital has tried their best to uh, send the message to all these messages to the this kind of vulnerable community. Next slide. So these are the, some of the pictures we have done for in the last one year. In the cyclone period, we're working in the seven districts in the coastal region, and we're providing emergency relief fund. We are providing tarpaulin, and for the after the initial period, we said provide the seeds, fish nets, and uh, providing the homes and foods for the people for the livelihood in the cyclone affected area. Next slide, please. And along with that. A cyclone Amphan period, the COVID is a big issue in this region also. And during this period, people are living in the shelter is a very without any developing any uh, social distancing there. So it is a big chance of spreading the virus at, at that region. So Dhaka Community Hospital were giving the providing the uh, awareness camping. We're mostly doing the awareness camping in this coastal region, and we providing uh, uh, teach them how to wash their hands, how to make in the social distancing and to, uh, teaching the people of this uh, uneducated people about these things and aware of the people to make them resilience is a very tough situation at the prison, but we try our best to do the community uh, to, to be resilient. Next slide. But the, what is the real, real scenario? After the some time, the initial two or three months after the outbreak of the COVID-19, we keep the people at home. But after the same time, the people, the vulnerable people stop caring about what is going to happen because they are really very found very little difference between the starvation and dying from the virus. So the people comes out their homes, go to the livelihood and without maintaining any social distancing and their safety, the loss of uh, affected number of affected people is increasing suddenly in the mid-June in our country and at that time the cyclone Amphan also affected. So to keep the people uh, safe from the virus and also keep the people for the livelihood is a very tough situation at that for this multiple disaster at that time. Next slide. What are the challenges we have faced during this multiple disaster? Actually, I just add one more thing because the uh, not only the COVID and the cyclone is the issue. It's the issue of the multiple disaster at the same time. So Bangladesh, we have also facing the refugee crisis in our country. It's a huge crisis for the globally. I think it's a big issue in Bangladesh. If you go to see the pictures of the refugee camp, the, all the people are living slow close and lots of people are living without any social distance and without maintaining any social security and to maintain any housing there. So DCST tried to combat this kind of all this disaster and facing this multiple disaster, we found it very difficult for our field staff to be secured enough because the at that time to go to this uh, uh, vulnerable uh, DCS staff, we feel that uh, uh, go to this uh, center to do to those support is very much difficult at that time. So field of security is a very big issue at the a big challenge at that time. And the lockdown providing by the government in the different, different sector and different part of Bangladesh also a big issue to provide for the civil societies and NGOs workers to work there. The emergency fund fund rising is a big issue during this COVID period because um, 
most of the ngos and the eono and the governments all are focusing mostly focusing on the covid issue but along with the with, during the multiple disaster uh, besides the covid issue the, it is very difficult to fund rising for this emergency response for the other disaster there and getting fund on time from the for the recent program from the donors because the, there is a lack of all the programs current programs are delayed and the and donors are not traveling to abroad so it is difficult to collecting the fund for maintaining the uh, maintaining and supporting the vulnerable communities another big issue and the monitoring and to uh, plan proper networking monitoring all these things as a big challenges this is multiple during this multiple disaster there next slide so this is my last, last slide so what are the, our recommendation what we the, the, during this multiple disaster what we have the, the conversing of covid 19 and cyclone pampan has shown us that we can no longer think of pandemic preparedness of disaster preparedness on a single disease the disaster we must consider the both and with both there is a common lesson investing in early warning and preparedness plays off by planning ahead of both climate and health issue, we can solve life and strengthening our economy. And the main goal and the main message from our side is that uh, to prevent this, a multi phase this multiple disaster, we have to prepare the community and to increase the resilience community, train the community to be a resilient one that can uh, sustain by their self. So, we can reduce the loss of lives and economic burden by the by preparedness of the people and our also goal to uh, achieve the same in the spring framework so preparedness preparedness to face the multiple disaster uh, at the same time is a to make the people resilience for to facing these kinds of multiple disaster is my main message today next slide thank you all Thank you, Dr. Fazul, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I had requested if any participant has any questions, they can put in the chat box, but uh, we haven't got any questions as of yet. Uh, but if there are any discussion points, we can take them in the plenary session, uh, plenary and open forum session, uh, which we'll do after the presentation of uh, all the speakers. So now I would like to invite Ms. Fateme Ashrafi for the next presentation. Uh, Ms. Fatima, your voice, you're not, you're not audible. No, we still can't hear. Ma'am, I would request you to kindly unmute yourself. There must be a button on the screen. Can you, Ayushi, can you unmute her? No, Akhilesh, uh, the participants can unmute themselves on their own. Uh, Ms. Fatima, there is a mic button. Can you just press it and unmute yourself? No. Can you just check her on via chart if she is there? She has logged out. I think she will just join. Hello? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, at the first, um, I would like to thank you very much for all organizers and uh, all audience uh, that right now 
uh, hear my voice. Uh, this is Fatima Ashrafi from Iran, uh, also from uh, Hami Association for Protection of Refugee Women and Children. Uh, we have started our work uh, around 1995. Um, as um, Iran find the, um, very big challenges with uh, huge, huge um, refugees from Afghan, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. And <clears throat> right now, uh, um, Iran is one of the most uh, host country for millions of Afghan refugees and uh, Iraqi refugees as well. Um, I uh, going fast to my presentation. Uh, next page, please. Uh, I concentrate uh, my uh, presentation in three pillars: fact and current situation, action and activities, and uh, challenges uh, and concern. Uh, next, please. Um, as a very fast overview, uh, I. I uh, would like to um, uh, tell about uh, some uh, points about the situation of uh, refugees in Iran. Around uh, 3.5 to 4 million Afghans and Iraqi refugees, asylum seekers and undocumented people uh, living in Iran. Just uh, nearly 1 million documented Afghan residents in Iran. And uh, uh, all of them, uh, around 2.5 million of them, um, uh, undocumented living in urban and uh, rural area. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, majority of Afghan people, particularly uh, undocumented Afghan people, live in economic challenges, family, where income um, earner, including women and children low education and awareness level coupled uh, with lack of access to personal protection equipment due to, due to financial reason put them at risk in terms of contracting the coronavirus uh, and spreading in future. Next please. Uh, most of job and uh, most of jobs Akhilesh, I guess uh, ma'am has had an issue with her network. So yes, she got she logged out. She will join. Okay. Hold for a few minutes. I request all the attendants. Uh, she will join again. Hello. Can someone take the slides further, mean discussion further, instead of wasting the time? Uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Ajit. Uh, yeah. The presenter uh, has prepared the slides, so I don't think there is anyone else from my organization to present. So we'll just wait for a minute. If she's not joining, okay. then we will request the next speaker. Hmm. We'll just wait for a minute or two. Okay, okay. I thought that somebody else is Conosant already shared the slideshow and Conosant, somebody else subordinate can take it further. Um, Fatima Ram has joined us. Um, okay, good, 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 good. good.
Hello? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm so sorry for taking a problem. That's fine. That's fine. Please, please carry on. We understand. Um, uh, a corona crisis that made uh, an economic collapse all over the country made lots of job opportunity vanish. The situation led to a wave of job losses between simple working, including refugees and migrants. Raising the domestic violence, especially for women and children during the pandemic of uh, COVID-19 in refugee community, um, has been reported. Next slide. Um, the country uh, has been facing the, a serious crisis since the outbreak and uh, after the beginning of the COVID-19 in February in Rome. Uh, the city, um, uh, one of the largest hosted cities um, for Afghan and Iraqi refugees in Iran. Decline or lose of income, especially for refugees and migrants uh, who do not uh, have legal residence uh, permit and do not have uh, insurance and per um, permanent employment support. Uh, HAMI have been started their activities in three uh, level, emergency level, recovery level, and advocacy level. In uh, emergency le level, uh, we started distributing, distribution of hygiene package, including virus uh, protection, face mask, uh, washing liquid, and other sanitation tools. In recovery level, providing a so, uh, social, uh, psychosocial support uh, to families who have lost a member of their family to COVID-19 and uh, as well as livelihood assistance to help them to solve the economic shocks, uh, economic shock during the pandemic. And uh, in uh, advocacy level, lobbying and, and negotiation with the government bodies and other public and uh, or private sector to uh, take uh, more services for refugees. Uh, some of the sample uh, uh, that our activities and responses is here. Uh, at the first, all of Ahami Education Center have been reopened despite the risk of the pandemic uh, to follow and monitor of uh, our refugee students uh, through online and present education activities on their health uh, prote uh, protocol, uh, identify and support uh, vulnerable fa families in four high-risk provinces uh, whose members were infected uh, with COVID-19, uh, prepared uh, more than 5,000 uh, food and health packages and sanitation for Afghan vulnerable families who were in uh, quarantine in, at home and establish a task force to support Afghan families whose uh, head uh, has died due to COVID-19. Uh, cooperation with Iranian Red Crescent Society to establish a committee uh, for supporting vulnerable refugee families, especially families with COVID-19 suffering. Uh, promoting measure uh, uh, to attract public uh, participation and governmental organization awareness to provide maximum support to the affected and vulnerable group uh, of Afghan refugees and asylum seekers in Iran. Next, please. Uh, establish a task force uh, uh, to offer legal, psychosocial, and uh, health counseling and answer frequently asked questions um, concerning cases of domestic violence, particularly violence against women and children in urban and, uh, and uh, settlement. Next, please. Uh, Hami Center in Qom and Mashhad provinces have started their economic activities for uh, COVID-19 uh, since the beginning of the corona crisis. Uh, entrepreneurship Center have started and focus on refugee women and try to um, compensate, um, compensate uh, for some of the economic shortcoming due to the lose of family job. In just three months after the pandemic, nearly one million face masks, uh, face masks and more than 45 
thousand guaranteed hygiene kit were produced by uh, these women, by by Afghan by Afghan women in Hami Entrepreneurship Entrepreneur uh, Center. All products uh, distributed to uh, vulnerable group in Iran and Afghanistan. Next, please. Next, please. Hello. Uh, and uh, uh, in this um, next, uh, next, please. Uh, in this regard, uh, Hami succeeded to protect more than uh, 3,000 students and their families during this crisis and took responsibility for education, for educating uh, some of uh, immigrants, children and families who do not have access to the formal education system. Next, please. Uh, the president, the president, ordered to admit free treatment for all refugees and asylum seeker was an opportunity that Hami has been has uh, had an uh, insisting advocacy to make it happen for refugees to re, uh, to receive non-discriminatory uh, access to treatment needed during uh, COVID-19. Next, please. Uh, just um, in finally, I want to uh, point in uh, some uh, point some challenges uh, that unfortunately we, we are facing uh, seriously. High number of Afghan refugees and asylum seekers, including undocumented uh, migrants, make protection difficult. Uh, continuing this situation for a longer time increasing the uh, average state of social uh, and domestic violence. Uh, the, fragile, uh, the fragile security situation, social and economic crisis in Afghanistan, increasing human trafficking and even uh, child trafficking from Afghanistan to Iran. Uh, United States uh, unilateral economic sanction against Iran, which have several affected the country with uh, shortage of resources. Lack of access to uh, international resources due to sanction has not only uh, overshadowed the lives of Iranian people, but also uh, endangered uh, the lives of around 4 million Afghan refugees and asylum uh, here. Next, please. And uh, the final word is, uh, ultimately, we have all been worked, working to create a situation where vulnerable groups, especially women and children, uh, who are suffering from all kinds of deprivation uh, and personal and domestic and uh, social violence, find a more peace. I thank you very much and uh, apologize, ap apologize for the technical problem. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fatime. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Ajit Satar Dekar. Uh, so his question is, what precise steps taken are taken by Iranian government to contain COVID-19 uh, as initially it was a havoc, but later on the number dwindled drastically? What are the initial steps which are taken by Iranian government uh, to tackle COVID-19? Uh, you know, uh, there are different uh, governmental official governmental office uh, have been working with, um, especially for um, uh, uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, but uh, in other side, all governmental bodies involving to um, crisis without any discrimination, uh, any, any discrimination, uh, including governmental health, uh, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education. Um, that, um, I, I, I remember uh, when I was in Semnon, one of the 
cities uh, with the biggest uh, settlements, uh, with gov um, refugee settlement. Um, I, I, um, we uh, reported some uh, cases uh, that uh, for um, financial problem cannot go to uh, to hospital. We reported this issue to the presidential office that this issue may be affected not only go, um, uh, refugee community, even maybe affected host community. And in other side, uh, majority of them, they are poor people and cannot uh, suffering uh, plus uh, economic prob problem. And uh, after a quick uh, response, um, we uh, saw uh, president's order that all Afghan refugees, um, even including uh, undocumented people, uh, can have access to um, free treatment um, for COVID-19. Hello? Unfortunately, unfortunately, I have no your sound. Akhil, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, I missed it. I missed Sorry. it. Uh, yeah, thank yeah. you, Ms. Fatima, for the response. Uh, I hope that has answered uh, Mr. Ajit's question. Uh, Mr. Dr. P. K. Rana is asking what key actions are taken by the organization to tackle legal or illegal migrants and refugees? So we'll, we'll take this question, uh, we'll take this point in the plenary session uh, uh, with Ms. Fatime. Uh, we'll invite next speaker, uh, Ms. Karen uh, Shaiva from Maha Piconet for her presentation. And uh, Dr. Rana, your question will be, or your point will be taken uh, during the plenary session. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fatime. Now I invite Ms. Karen. You're welcome. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting us to be a part of this really important conversation. Uh, I think we all understand the need uh, and the issues that have happened and how uh, coming together becomes really important. So I'm really pleased as the Secretariat and Nodal Partner for the Maha Pico Net and Jeevan Rath Program by UNICEF to talk a little bit about how we responded to the COVID as a coalition um, based on relief and recovery measures. Yeah. So once again, uh, good afternoon to my co-panelists, uh, to the participants, and above all, the organizers. Uh, when we got started, that is my organization, the Rise Infinity Foundation and IDOBRO, we obviously got started right from the day the pandemic started. And, and one of the things that we realized very quickly is that the situation was so uncertain and so difficult to assess in terms of what can be done, how it can be done, you know, what is safe, how do you mitigate the risk, and yet, you know, make sure you reach out to the most vulnerable groups and frontline workers. How do you really do that? And for us, the answer was very simple and clear on the wall that we had to do it through partnerships. And so that was really how we got started working with a whole network of people across uh, India. Um, and through this, we reached out to over 24 states and 38 cities in India that we helped. And in the first 25 days itself, we reached out to over half a million people. And as I said, this is not something that we did alone. This was done because of all the different partners with whom we worked with right through this. Uh, with our focus was obviously vulnerable groups and frontline workers, in them also certain specific groups that I'll speak about in a bit. And the way we looked at it was, of course, relief for survival and protection. Uh, as I said, over 60 partners and coalitions, including, <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me, the Jeevan Rath uh, Initiative facilitated by UNICEF Maharashtra. As I said, we reached out to half a million people in this first, uh, first phase of our work with them. And we really looked at those who were really in need, you know, and, and not just in need, but the ones that were unreached. And so we tried to look and search really deep and hard uh, because one of the biggest problems that we realized <coughs> during the pandemic 
was the duplication of efforts. So on one hand, you would see that you know people would be sending rounds of ration distribution to the same community, you know, morning and night, while there would be other pockets that would not be getting for days on end. And so it really was very important for us to identify those in need and those who are unreached. And so that was the way we went around doing this. Also, we looked at people who had specific needs and seen how we could help those. So identifying a beneficiary and disaggregating data to make sure you're reaching the ones who are truly in need was really the, was really the mandate that we were given with. Uh, we looked at it from multiple points of view, travel assistance for migrants across states. We created a crisis management center so that we could instantaneously Honestly, or at least at the very least, uh, you know, within 24 hours, respond to people who are seeking assistance for uh, emergency requirements. And this included not just physical distribution of all the different items that were required, but also cash benefit transfers that were done for the beneficiaries. As I said, this work that we did was really in two phases, where the first phase from mid-March, mid-May, where we worked with around 25 partners across India was for a number of different things from, you know, cloth masks to PPE kits to ration kits uh, across a large number of things, including a telemedicine initiative that we uh, partnered with. And uh, a lot of this help came through um, our helpline and a distress line that was set up and run practically, um, I would say, about 18 hours at least for sure, 18 to 20 hours, in fact, I would say, you know, uh, that would go around the clock and uh, supported by Glenmar Foundation. Post that was the phase two where we uh, got involved and you know partnered with UNICEF where the Jeevan Rat program was put into place uh, based on the migrants who were walking back home. And that's when all the different partners of UNICEF were convened by them to look at how could we really reduce duplication how could we make our work even more effective and how could we ensure that we were really helping those who desperately were in need and we all know how bad the situation was at that time and that's when the crisis management center was set up uh, as a virtual call center which is also a, a innovation at that point in time because obviously people couldn't travel people could not uh, you know uh, be in one place and, and so there's so many other the difficulties. So this this made so much sense uh, to set it up, and uh, Rise Infinity Foundation was the secretariat and the nodal partner for this. But this included sixty other partners, as you can see. It was a lot of work done by multiple partners working in different ways to support each other as well as to complement each other in in different parts of of Maharashtra. And uh, the crisis management center worked fifteen hours a day, as you can see over here, in three shifts you know with continuous executives uh, talking in different languages to make sure that we were able to reach out to as many people and that language would not be a barrier because that was a major 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 issue uh, we started in in this too we had three types of things where we first started as food trucks you know that actually took the food to where people were walking then of course the crisis management center to identify people wherever they were and helping them and last but not the least has been the third part where we are now looking Looking at system strengthening to take it further. A lot of this work has been documented because I believe that without documentation, <clears throat> we do not learn our lessons well enough. Yeah, and if we learn our lessons, we need to be able to share them and also be able to go back to them uh, if, God forbid, we have another pandemic. And therefore, I think documenting processes, good policies, good practices is extremely important for us to take further the learnings from this uh, unprecedented situation. Uh, and as, as was explained even earlier by my co-panelists, uh, we also were hit with double whammies, right? So it wasn't just the pandemic crisis, but we also had multiple other crises that happened simultaneously. So in, in some cases, as rightly pointed out, you know, uh, was that literally a sense of helplessness that's coming in, that what next, you know? And so the more uh, we as, uh, what you call it, uh, as CBOs, as civil society, as uh, uh, partners who want to respond and assist on the ground, 
the more we uh, are prepared and learn from these things, I think it makes a big, big difference. And so we've documented and also recognized the efforts of so many of our partners through these uh, methods. It was a coffee table book that was created, reports that were created, and then finally, of course, an exclusive website on the efforts that had been done by them. As I said, we are now into phase three. I am going a little fast on the this presentation just in the interest of time. And hopefully, if there are questions, we can always, of course, look at those slides once again more in detail. But now we are in our phase three, and a lot of the relief work is over. But I said a lot, not all, yeah, because I think there is still a huge need remaining, and we are doing that with the government. So we're looking now at a recovery stage and system strengthening for government programming, social programming by the state government, and helping them to do the ration kit distribution to specific communities that require that help even now going forward. And so there, the target is working with 20,000 families and the different government projects that would help them to support in terms of recovery measures as well. Some of the innovations, as I spoke about earlier a little bit, was, of course, the virtual call center where we did not uh, you know, uh, set up a new uh, system in place, but just worked with people right out of their homes, but on a cloud-based mechanism so that we could actually track and monitor exactly what were the efforts, what needed to be done, what are the outcomes, and therefore work further and keep designing our work as it can required to be evolved uh, to meet the needs of people. We also realized one big, big thing, and that was that, you know, food as a problem is not going to get over, right? The, uh, the pandemic only aggravated it. The pandemic made it center stage. The pandemic highlighted that problem. But that problem was there much before, and the problem, unfortunately, is going to continue to happen. And so we started this campaign called the Looking Backward, Moving Forward campaign under the Jivanrat program, because that's what the, the Mahapikonet is, the group or the coalition. But the program, as it started, was the Jivanrat program. Uh, Jivan means giving life, and Rat was like the, the trucks that were going. So that's how it got started. But continuing with that idea was that how can we learn from what has happened, but move forward and create more sustainable solutions. And so the whole concept of nutri gardens, microgreens was started upcycling. Plastic became another endemic by itself, right? We all know the amount of plastic that was generated through all the distribution, all the bio waste, the, all the, uh, I'm sorry, medical waste. Uh, there was just so much of that happening around. And so uh, these were two things we thought were very important for us to start helping the community to feel that they were empowered to deal with their problems and that they would be able to take forward some solutions at least that would help them feel a lot more in control of what is happening around them and not just feel helpless about that, you know, whatever comes next, we're just going to have to bear it and, you know, so the looking forward, uh, uh, looking backward, moving forward campaign on nutrition uh, and, and uh, environmental solutions. We also did one very uh, important initiative, which was to start mapping the work done by other NGOs. And I think this is really important because we realized very early on that there is just so much of duplication that was happening, that there was a need for us to create a neutral platform where NGOs could register and just put in only macro details. We did not ask for any kind of beneficiary information, no micro details at all. Just simply let us know that you distributed food in this area and to so many uh, you know, kids or so much. This is the profile of the people you gave it to so that people, others could also know, OK, that all right, this has happened over here. Maybe I can look somewhere else. So this helped us, one, I think, recognize the efforts of the NGOs because they've put in so much into making this happen. I don't think without the civil society, you know, uh, I, I shudder to think what would have been the situation like at that point in time. And so one is recognizing the efforts, and two is also to make sure that we could identify gaps or underserved area. And I think in some way it also helped to increase transparency for donors. Because when donors started to see that this is the work that is happening firsthand, then I think and getting reported on a public uh, platform, I think it definitely built uh, a lot of confidence and, and of course, uh, the coming forward to really support and continue to help us. 
As I said, we are now in our phase three and we are in our recovery mode where while the uh, relief, uh, the relief measures continue by working with government, we are now looking at what can we do for recovery. And recovery, as we all know, can imagine that when you have been without a source of income for months together, then definitely revenue generation is the key to that. And therefore, we are now focusing on what we call C. So the skill development, the employment, and finally, entrepreneurship. Within each of these two, we have looked at very specific groups so that we can fine tune the way we are working with each one of them and therefore help them. So skill development was more focused towards youth, migrants, daily workers, whereas employment was to look at the vulnerable groups who, you know, you are not going to be able to do anything but give them a job. I mean, that's the way that you move. And last but not the least is entrepreneurship, where we focused on women, self-help groups and women social green enterprises. But before we could do that, I think it was very important that we do a skill mapping benefit of all the beneficiaries. And so this was a huge community on the ground exercise. While we already had the crisis management center and that was continuing, uh, you know, we, we which had tracked over 70,000 migrants from their start of uh, travel to their hometown, uh, we decided that no, the skill mapping would be something that would be right now on the ground because we wanted an outcome where we would be able to go back to them and say, look, you gave us your information. Now here's an opportunity for you to try and get a job, for you to try and get your uh, get reskilled or to find training that would help you to find a job. So this was a very, very big exercise that was done uh, by many volunteers. And, and it was amazing to see, again, how so many NGOs came forward to just say, yes, we need to do this for our mem members because we know it's so important to get them back on their feet. As I said, while the Jeevanrath program was one of the most uh, visible one uh, in terms of the community uh, support and food in particular, uh, the Maha Pekunet is a coalition of uh, now almost 75 partners, in fact, as it has grown even further. And where we have, uh, where they have been working on so many other projects as well and so many other interventions as well. So I just kind of shared a very short time, uh, timeline to kind of show, which also demonstrates that any intervention can never work in a silo, you know, because it's not only about partnership within your project, but it's also partnership across the needs of the community that you are working with. And so it is. it was really beautiful to see how we complemented each other, you know even in the kind of services that we had. So whether you look at the urban wash COVID pro, uh, response program, the shelter management, look at the menstrual health hygiene program, the school readiness, the village preparedness. I think there were just so many complementary bits that pieces that went together to really ensure that we could create an impact and which has now gone far beyond a, a, a million people. So, and this is in this short period of about six to eight months, right? So so this has only been possible because of the kind of coalition that was brought together by UNICEF uh, Maharashtra and the kind of work that we could do as a secretariat to support that work and make sure that we were all complementing each other. I would, of course, like to say thank you to our entire PicoNet partners and many others who have helped. And I just want to maybe share maybe just a minute on what is this PicoNet, right, in terms of um, how does it work, right? So I think for us to find, we all know that there are problems and we need to find solutions. So you have enterprises who come up with the solution. It can be a for-profit enterprise, it can be a non-profit enterprise, but we need those solutions. However, solutions on their own are not going to gain traction unless we have the kind of people who are willing to adopt it, who are willing to push it, willing to promote it, willing to, uh, to support it. So there is so much that we require in terms of building traction. And that comes from those citizens that really help us to build that traction. Last but not the least, I think, as I said even before, you need partners, you need donors, you need so much other support that will allow you to scale it up. So one is, you know, getting traction on 
the ground for adoption and and for uh, adaptation but also you need to have support uh, to be able to scale an intervention to be able to take it to as i said when we got started with just 1000 2000 people to taking it to a million people now so i think this is really the beauty of building your own pico net and if you realize i missed the o so the o is the ownership i hope you can see over here the pico net the o is the ownership of all the stakeholders are involved in this that allows them to say that this is our problem and we need to work together because we have a shared vision a common purpose that will allow us to take us further and work together and leverage our strengths and fill up the gaps that may exist between us and with that i would like to say thank you very much and if there are any questions i would be very happy to take them uh, thank you miss uh, karen that was a wonderful presentation uh, we don't have any questions or discussion points at this stage. Uh, I'll invite the next speaker, Mr. Rahul Day, uh, for his presentation. Uh, thanks, Akhilesh. Now, uh, is my PPT visible? Can you hear me? Yeah, it's visible. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, thank you very much uh, for all of your wonderful PPTs and presentations and sharing your experiences. Uh, also your organizations talking about. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about here is uh, we understand what's been happening all over the world about it during the COVID and uh, uh, in India is also impacted a lot. Uh, after COVID, uh, we kind of did a lot of work on capacity building. Uh, as you all might know, I assume you have heard about radar and uh, we have been working for capacity building since our inception. So capacity building is one of our major activities in which Radar does. Uh, with that, uh, so we have been working capacity building. We did capacity building work from beforehand also uh, online, but during COVID it has, we gone a bit far level. So if, you, if I talk about how much we did, uh, we have reached almost 79,231 7, person have registered uh, or attended our training, uh, which number some of the, I think 20% uh, is less than the people whom we have covered. Uh, I'll talk about the reasons how, why I'm talking about the last number of people in this number and uh, who are the people. So while we talk about, so we did a lot of trainings for NGOs, civil societies, government, line departments and other peoples too. Uh, but in these presentations, I'm going to focus mainly on frontline workers and government line departments or elected members uh, in two states where we have been working. Uh, so while talking about this 79231 number uh, covers municipality uh, people who are, we can also talk about the urban local bodies people, uh, PRI, Panchayat uh, representative, elected, uh, wash department, uh, this has a water sanitation and hygiene department. So I have put it as a wash department as it because some of the people are from water supply department, some of where from sanitation department and some where who are responsible for capacity building or enhancing department capacity and hygiene improvement facilities and also bringing awareness within the community. So I've mixed all of it into one category as a wash department. Uh, then also a bit higher level when we talk about frontline workers, we have also got sanitary inspectors in one of the states uh, we covered village task forces. Uh, some of them were where uh, radar has been associated. Some of them have been uh, done by government. Uh, so these are the few few people which were mainly focused. Apart from there, are a lot more people who were there uh, when you talk about uh, our online capacity building effort. So what we did, or what we have discussed about, or what kind of things we did. Uh, if I talk about the what we did, we have done various range of trainings. Uh, here I have put in few of them, uh, which talks about, like, say, training on application of humanitarian standard and principles for IG Gujarat, training for project management for IG Gujarat. We did online training for frontline workers, uh, for government line department and civil society organizations for COVID-19 response. So here are the main, I just put in the key main topics. So when I talk about online trainings on frontline workers for government and line departments, so we did also customize trainings for various departments, say we, if we did for water supply department, we 
customize the training was suitable for water supply department. If we are doing for sanitation department, then we customize it for them. So we had the main uh, module which talks about, which covers the entire topic. Then it has, it allows us to talk about, uh, to address the specific needs uh, based on the participants. Uh, okay, so then we did trainings for COVID response for our local bodies, then again, frontline workers, again, PRM members, frontline workers. Then also we, we because the COVID came during a time of one of the hazard prone areas or timing in India, so at the time, some many plus cyclones are happening, many plus floods are happening. So we were dealing not only with COVID, we are also dealing with flood cyclones. So it was a multi-hazard situation uh, in, the, in the time. So we were also doing that uh, while you do the capacity building. We also, so while doing our work for capacity building activities for frontline workers, a uh, few of the government department, they came forward. They, they also asked us to talk to if we can do capacity building for a village GST management force, which were also been part of in COVID responses through government efforts. So we did capacity building for them. Plus, we also did the preparedness activities for them, like how they can plan, how we all know, uh, must have, uh, you must have heard about village GST management planning process, where village prepares their own GST management plans. They, Took their own responsibility who will do what so for that which normally trainings happens like obviously offline trainings where people meet each other they discuss things but we also took up that challenge and we did uh just management planning process for village level we did trainings for uh bdmp people and task force members which is the response was quite good uh, i'll talk about the challenges and lesson learned which is the main part of from for uh my presentation so when I talk about what are the lessons we have learned uh, during this online capacity building, I have seen like after COVID, it was like floods of online training, uh, <coughs> either free, either paid, and the non-paid. So it was like floods of uh, capacity building efforts, like all over the world, it's been happening. Webinars were happening every day, maybe multiple times, hundred times, but how radar did and what is what was our learning from uh, the whole effort so one of the thing which i understood is uh, it is crucial to address customized capacity building need it is not possible <coughs> uh, we like anyway india is diverse we speak so many languages uh, <coughs> uh, geographies are different uh, geographical locations are different there are various people uh, it speaks various languages. Plus, when, it, when we talk about frontline workers, so frontline workers does not come from just only one department. It's not just that sanitation department came for the sanitation department. It's also, say, panchayat members. Uh, uh, it's from, uh, say, revenue department. It's from PWD work. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's from health department, the ASA workers, the Anganwari workers who are at the front, forefront who are working it. So I think it is, it is crucial to understand what requirement they have and what kind of a learning need uh, do they have. And if we can address that need and the way they require it, I think that's important for a successful uh, capacity building process. Uh, anyway, that supposedly should be part of any kind of a capacity building effort, uh, be it online or offline. Uh, but I think uh, in online training, it's become more crucial uh, uh, because in offline training, you can give a time, you have time period where you can sit together, you can discuss with the people here. You should be prepared, you have less timing and there are, uh, pe the trainings are shorter. So we have to very specific so that we add, we can, we'll be able to address the need uh, of the participant during the time has given. Uh, and also while you, while you talk about the group uh, coming in for the, for the, for the trainings, uh, there are people who have individual needs, even for, say, for instance, when, when, when looking at this small picture uh, on the on the right side of the screen, if we see police officials are sitting, the other frontline guy who is sitting, for, for in this picture, he's from a sanitation department, so he's also sitting, and then police officers. So the, both are trying, their effort is to minimize the risk of COVID. They're all working. But every these two individuals have their different responsibilities. 
so the training efforts or capacity building efforts should be able to cater to these individual needs that only it will be successful only that only people will be attentive or they will like your training otherwise it's just listening about what anybody is talking about so i think that's important and it the capacity building should be a process rather than just an activity it should not be like okay we have organized two hours uh training we just uh, people will log in and people will okay how many login we got and people have done and our training has been successful so i think that's that's not going to work out uh, that's not going to going to happen so for a for a capacity so we have to treat it as a, as a as a process and when we when we talk about online capacity building it is not just the webinar where people coming and sitting it can be a part of it it should include multiple efforts so maybe when you talk about there are so getting a link of a online where people are coming and sitting and listening to somebody uh, i think we should not be limited just by doing that where we should enhance our we should be creative how we can do that based on the participants need based on availability of resources but we should not be limit our capacity building effort just by making people sit for uh, a webinar uh, so one of the things few things what we have done uh, while doing and while we learn in the in the process is that a systemic approach is very important uh, like for instance one of the things was pretty successful for me during this covid period was that the one of the, we did a national level uh, learning need assessment after covid has impacted all over india so that was for ngo people uh, then we did a so before we do trainings in uh, gujarat we did a learning need assessment for csos and ngo partners over there and we also try to cater to uh, address the frontline workers to understand what is their kind of a need i think that really helped us to understand how vast diverse uh, capacity building requirements people have uh, so that is important uh, one of the examples i would not mention the name of the states but if i, if I compare state a and state b where i have been working state a had a systematic uh, logistic facility existing from longer period their panchayat offices are connected with online say screen uh, speakers microphone facility which really helped us to do a uh, capacity building work during the initial period itself and where these facilities does not exist there we really faced a problem so i think logistic because when when you talk about online trainings the good internet connectivity people people able to see the screen properly, people able to talk in the screen, in screen uh, properly. I think that's, that's, uh, uh, that's important. I think it's, it's, it's not about just about listening to somebody talking. It's also important for participant to participate and they, it, they able to share their opinion and people can listen to it because many of the people when I, when I was part of it, so there were very great points, great efforts individuals has been doing and where we could learn a lot from them i think that's really important uh, existing networks can help it's always been helpful uh, my previous presenter also talking about uh, combining efforts how how that has been successful the existing networks always can help like the networks by government or civil societies or people that's always been uh, been helpful to knowing understanding disseminate informations uh making it reach to the last people under the line that's always been helpful uh <clears throat> secondly i think online trainings uh requires a unique approach which is not just about uh coming somebody and talking about i've already mentioned before also it should be a mix of blended approach there are many people which may be just like watching cartoons maybe just like to read they might be just like a message so i think the training should not be just limited by somebody coming in and talking about certain things or information i think reinforce reinforcement is is important uh, so for that we can have different approaches either you share messages you talk about a group discussion uh, your, your people have whatsapp groups or anything whatever people do but i think that's important it should not be limited by uh, 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 just coming and talking in a webinar and giving giving a lecture and i think we should be we should be able to explore ourselves beyond the existing models uh, so many of the 
people, many of the model which talks about people are coming in, joining for a webinar, a uh, maximum they get a, a home assignment. Or there are free, there are, there are few which talks about there's a pre-recorded video which people go and read, then the, then they fill up some online form and then the, the, done their trainings. I think we should not be limited by that. We in Nedar, we are now exploring the opportunity of blended learning. Uh, blended learning. Hopefully, by the end of the year, we'll have a full-fledged process of uh, 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 what's called blended learning process, which will be available uh, for uh, everybody in Nedar uh, and outside within India, outside India, for different customized re requirements. We we are trying to do that. Uh, we'd also like to know if others are doing something on that. We'd like to hear, we'd, we'd love to know about it. So what I want to convey is that it's important us to experiment, uh, go beyond thinking about just the webinar or just to sending the video and making it just in course. So I think we should be, and I think we are limited so far, well, whatever my limited understanding of global course is going on. I think we need to explore more and we need to do a bit of hard work to understand that. Uh, one of the important which i which i would like to understand which i'm not so sure about so far uh the trainings online capacity building whatever we did we need to also assess the impact uh what happened beyond that so say people have attended during the training maybe they've attended the whole entire training maybe multiple trainings and they're doing their job but what impact really happened during this training period or what impact they felt after they attended this this training so that really need to, I think that's where uh, we have a plan, Radar has a plan to uh, do an assessment, to understand what the impact happened. I have got one or few international international papers which did a bit of research on that, but I think all the efforts which we are doing during this COVID, uh, because during this COVID, everything gone online. So I think we really need to, or do an assessment about what impact these capacity building efforts has really made and or to understand what if there's a gap how we can improve that gap and how we can do our work in a better way uh, sorry next okay so that's uh, all so far from my side uh, uh, i assume that you all guys know about radar and uh, feel free to explore our all social media platforms our website and i'm happy to share that uh, radar is also an iso certified organization please do visit us in our online play platforms and i'll be happy to talk share more uh, if we have more questions thank you very much thank you rahul uh, for the presentation and enlightening about the work uh, which you have been doing during the covid 19 uh, I see there are no questions as of now. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, Ms. Maria Holzberg uh, as our next speaker. Good evening, Maria. Thank you so much. Can I just ask if you can hear and see me? Yeah, we can see Great. you and hear you. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, all colleagues and uh, uh, apologies, I have one more question. Uh, what is the time that I have left? Uh, you have 15 minutes as allocated to you. Okay, thank you so much. So we are very pleased uh, to be here, to be allowed to be presenting to this uh, excellent group. And the webinar has really been very, very good up to, to now. So thank you very much for this. Uh, I'm here representing the Gender in Humanitarian Action Working Group, uh, which is a group composed of UN agencies and INGOs, as well as local groups that are engaged in various types of humanitarian action. And I'm here to talk a bit about how localized surge um, or how we need to ensure that localized surge includes women-focused organizations. And the way I plan to do this is by sharing with you some, uh, some research that we have been doing uh, as part of our group. So the next slide, please. So what we see is that uh, evidence from humanitarian action underscores the criticality and the benefits of gender equality 
approaches to programming. And this includes recovery for crisis, and this includes recovery from the COVID-19. So we do see that if you are being gender responsive, you will see an increased access of education and positive education outcomes for both boys and girls. We see improved access to water and sanitation. We see improved food security, as well as improved gender equality. So we know that the benefits of gender-focused action is sizable, and there's many global studies, one that indicates that the benefit to cost ratios averaging $8 for every $1 spent, uh, we still see that the funding is received is actually disproportionately lower for gender programming. So we know that only 39% of tar uh, programs targeted to the needs of women and girls are funded, whereas 69% of overall appe uh, appeal requests are funded. So uh, we have done a uh, an assessment of funding flow for the COVID responses under the Global Humanitarian Response Plan focused on Afghanistan, Cox's Bazaar, and Myanmar. And we saw that in this assessment, and this was the first plan, there were two plans, um, we see that the direct donor contribution to NGOs was actually zero and that INGOs have received 20 million, but local NGOs only 2.5. But among those, none of them have been women-focused organizations. So there's many reasons why we can explain these figures, and that is including the fact that the Global Humanitarian Response Plan developed for COVID was initially designed as a UN funding appeal. However, we also want to say that we are far from reaching the grand bargain commitment, which says that at least 25% of humanitarian funding must go to local and national responders as directly as possible to improve outcomes for affected people and reduce transaction costs. We can go to the next slide, please. So we did these uh, quick visibility scans. And so you can see here where we see uh, these are developed in within the parameters of what, from a gender lens, we see are essential actions. So we see that about half of the plans uh, made the effort to collect sex, age, disability disaggregated data. Because if you don't know who you're helping and supporting, which you, you can only know through collection of data, you won't be able to target your work, uh, uh, your work appropriately. And evidence shows that if you do not collect sex age disaggregated data, you usually miss uh, women and girls. This is followed by the need for a proper gender analysis. So there was more gender analysis than there usually is, but it's still not enough. There has been an increase of activities in addressing the, the gender-based violence, which is you increased in all times of disaster. We have enough evidence to show this. What we also saw was that there, there are very few mentions of LGBTIQ or gender diverse groups. So about 60% uh, with no reference to this. Next slide, please. So this is uh, some more, a deep dive into uh, how humanitarians are planning for diverse uh, participation. And that includes then how we use this visibility scan of what we actually looked at if, if women groups were part of this. We also looked at how the gender and age marker was being used. As you know, there is a gen an online gender and age marker that is open for anyone to use 
online uh, in order to both target, develop, implement, and monitor your programming. So this is a very good tool for you all to use in your own programming approaches. You can move to the next slide now, please. So now you have the, the backdrop. Uh, and against this analysis, uh, our group, which is the Gender in Humanitarian Action Working Group, convened a virtual listening session on the state of gender and funding in the COVID-19 response. So this took place in July. And we included representatives from organizations and networks that serve diverse women to share their views. And uh, the, you have access to these slides where the names of the organizations are, but I will also read them for you. So we had Voice of Women Organization. We had Her Pakistan. We had representation from ASEAN Feminist, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Queer Network. We had the South Asia Disability Forum. We had the RW Welfare Society and Kareni National Women's Organization. We also had HomeNet South Asia and PKKK, which is an organization uh, operating from Indonesia. So this was a very diverse group, and I, I'm not sure you can see the different perspectives that were raised, but we really wanted to bring in voices from the LGBT community, the disability community, adolescent girl community, as well as those providing caregiver uh, support, as well as refugee women. And across the board, as you can see in this illustration, we saw, saw how the, the organizations serving diverse women and girls identified ways in which the pandemic exacerbated existing needs and caused new needs to, to emerge. And I will share some of the things that they uh, suggested. There was an increase in gender-based violence in home coupled with reduced access to gender-based violence services. And this included heightened risk of violence for lesbian, bisexual, and queer women locked down in unsafe households. There were barriers to accessing life-saving messages and information on COVID-19, in particular for women living with disabilities. There were structural barriers in accessing healthcare and essential services, including barriers to accessing menstrual hygiene and management supplies. We saw human rights defenders and exclusion of marginalized women in government policies, particularly for home-based workers who faced sharp reductions in renumative work during the pandemic, but they were not able to access social safety nets. There's also limited control over the use of COVID-19 relief items. Next slide, please. So the key messages is that obviously pre-existing gender inequalities and needs of women and girls were exacerbated and it added new operational challenges for women focused organizations despite the different operational challenges we the that we still felt that these groups were able to provide services in the face of the very, very challenging situation. So we noticed that as early as, as April, that 71% of women-focused uh, civil society organizations surveyed by UN Women had reported that uh, COVID-19 was affecting them somewhat or very negatively, with 12% needing to suspend activities. And we saw that these type of trends continued um, 
these type of trends continued for organizations serving all kinds of diverse populations. So for instance, the Asia Pacific Transgender Network reported that all of their project partners expressed concern about how to sustain operational cost. So women, it's important to mention that women-focused organizations provide very critical services, and they are usually those that uh, reach the last miles. And this include providing critical and life-saving gender-based violence services. They provide seed banking and support clusters of women farmers to preserve seeds and food culture. They provide financial assistance to women with disabilities and support them to access online work. They develop one-stop solutions that provide education using chat box or uh, free telegynecology services and e-commerce platforms for sexual reproductive health needs, which is an example coming from uh, Pakistan. And they create awareness for uh, material for women home-based workers. So all of these points actually build towards what we want to see in a full humanitarian response. However, these groups are commonly not being funded in the, the, the current framework. So next slide, please. Let me just check the timing. So I will be closing now, but I want to just leave with the key point, and that is please, work towards investing where it makes a, a difference. And that is, in our opinion, funding women-focused organizations in the region. We have very, very clear recommendations that have been developed for do uh, donors, for the humanitarian leadership, uh, to advise on how to, to take this work forward. Last slide, please. We want to leave you with this point, which is uh, listen to providers on the ground and make sure that women are involved in your response planning. And this includes women groups that are working in your context, in your settings, women networks or clusters of women, uh, women organizations that work together. These groups are most have the best ear of the community and can support the work that you are advancing for, for a better recovery. Final slide, please. And we can uh, skip this and go to the next slide. I just want to say thank you very much on behalf of my co-chairs, who is from the from UN OCHA, uh, CARE International, and from UN Women, which is where uh, I come from. Thank you very much for this uh, and have a great uh, afternoon. Over. Thank you, Ms. Maria. Uh, that was an interesting uh, presentation and a very balanced gendered view of how uh, COVID-19 response uh, has missed on some things and where the investment uh, should be focused. Uh, we would have loved uh, to hear the slide which uh, mentioned about uh, investing uh, in the women-focused organization. Uh, maybe uh, we can take that up during the plenary session. Uh, now, uh, I would request if uh, there are any participants who would like to share any thoughts, initial thoughts, or any comments. Uh, they, on the topics uh, which were discussed, uh, please, uh, the house is open and you can share your thoughts. Uh, it's open for the presenters also, if they would like to share more on uh, some, something. I just had a question if it's the appropriate time to ask. Yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead. Uh, 
Um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting to see such wonderful presentations. And uh, for the participants, I'm Divya. I've, I'm also a member of the Red Art India roster. And independently, I've been deploying in my capacity as protection, gender, and community engagement personnel. And I wanted to see if either uh, any of the participants, uh, particularly the one who have presented a lot on gender, humanitarian action network, can talk a bit about their experience if they have um, they, if they have experienced any crackdown on uh, community-based complaint mechanisms and impact of COVID on them and any increase in PSCA issues, uh, which is sexual exploitation and abuse, on more more around humanitarian accountability. If uh, particularly there are many of you who talked a bit about distribution delays, impact on that. So these are the things that have some direct linkage to these uh, CBCMs. So if anyone can comment and what kind of uh, measures they took to address these gaps and what was their strategy in ensuring humanitarian accountability uh, issues are not having too much impact because of COVID. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Divya. Uh, amongst the uh... Presenters, uh, if anyone would like to take up her question, uh, if I may summarize, uh, she is asking about uh, the protection and uh, sexual abuse issues which were encountered uh, during the COVID-19 response and any crackdowns uh, which were which took place on the community complaint and feedback mechanism. So maybe I could take um, not I, I don't have a direct answer for you, Divya, but as as a as a um, organization that has been involved with humanitarian aid and response uh, over there uh, on a large scale, <clears throat> we um, gratefully uh, did not receive any such issues. But one of the things that does come as part of the accountability factor is that we necessarily as the unicef partners need to sign you know and be assured of policies and practices in place to take care of any such instance happening so any kind of sexual exploitation and abuse okay uh, is is part of the policy requirement from our side so i think um, from a point of um, you know uh, process and due diligence to ensure that partners are aware of the issue Partners are cognizant of the process required um, to tackle it and what are the policies that need to be in place to deal with it. I think all these are taken care of uh, in, in the uh, partner capacity building as well as the association uh, when we do that with, uh, with an agency like UNICEF. So I, I don't know if that answers, uh, at least partially I hope it answers your question in terms of accountability, but in terms of um, uh, such instances, um, we have not had the, uh, we have not had the occasion to really have to deal with that. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, would anyone else amongst the presenters uh, would like to Respond. Nothing. Uh, any more, uh, you know, initial uh, comments or uh, responses uh, to the presentations which just took place? Or any? Yeah. Yeah, please. Okay, uh, Miss Fateme is still there. Uh, Ms. Ms. Fatame, there was a question from Dr. Rana uh, for you. 
what key actions were taken by the organization to tackle legal or illegal migrants and refugees i think she is not here uh, if they are not if no one has uh, there, there are no more uh, you know uh, comments or any discussion points uh, i would invite uh, takeshi san from edrr network to uh, conclude and uh, give a vote of thanks Pakistan, over to you. <clears throat> yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you for um, organizing the webinar. Um, I think, um, you know, as some of you have highlighted already, um, if we ask ourselves um, on behalf of ADRN, uh, if we ask ourselves, if we truly understand the, the situation, the circumstance, uh, environment of the local stakeholders while we talk about the localization, I think there is a little bit of a question mark to it. And when we talk about the search capacity and the role of local actors, and as uh, our colleague from Red R also presented, you know, if we truly understand um, what are the specific needs, specific learning needs or specific uh, responsibilities of the, each of the players. I think that deepening understanding of these stakeholders at the local level is, is truly a key. Um, and by understanding that, I think we will be able to think about, you know, what, what sort of surge capacity can we actually facilitate? And therefore, um, as a, on behalf of ADRN, uh, we would like to thank um, all the speakers, the panelists, and the participants for uh, today's webinar. I think it has given us um, really um, specific food for thoughts, and particularly ADRN, as ADRN is going through our new stra strategy making process. Uh, it's a very important um, uh, perspective for us to, to carry forward. And I think we have to turn them into specific action as our, we have our commitment to make this region more resilient. And I think uh, we heard about the perspectives of how that can be achieved. So thank you very much for enlightening us. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for participating today. On behalf of ADRN, really uh, a huge vote of thanks. I could send over to you. Uh, thank you, Takashi. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks. I thank all the presenters uh, and the participants who attended this webinar. Uh, it was a pleasure having you all here. Uh, this webinar is closed now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.